Parasitism is an extremely effective ecological strategy, and it has independently evolved on Earth countless times. Like predation, it's a form of consumer resource interaction, a term used to describe interspecies relationships within ecological food chains. Parasitism can be defined as an instance where an organism lives on or inside another, exploiting it for its own benefit and to the detriment of the host. With a few exceptions, parasitism does not kill the host organism. Rather, it reduces their fitness in some way. Some parasites change the behavior of their host, while others functionally castrate them. Lots of parasites are highly specialized, with many evolving to solely target a single group or even species of host organism. It also tends to be the case that parasites are smaller in size than their host and reproduce at a faster rate, meaning that multiple generations can spawn within the lifespan of the larger animal. It's important to note that while most cases of parasitism on both Earth and Isla adhere to these rules, there are instances where these interspecific relationships are harder to define and lean towards other classifications such as mutualism or symbiosis. For example, the clade of plants known as Interiomorphiae, which grow within trees such as Megaeodrontus communalis. Interiomorphs originated as entirely parasitic organisms, however, over millions of years of evolution, they shifted closer and closer to a mutualist lifestyle. Initially, relatives of species such as Diflorus otteratium sapped nutrients from the trunks of Eodronta trees, however, over time, it became more advantageous for them to share nutrients with the host. Now, these species exchange sugars and macronutrients with the trunk, using special hybridized tissues belonging to both plants. In exchange for sustenance from the tree, interiomorphs provide nutrients which Megaeodrontus communalis cannot produce on its own. In some species, these plants even help to mount an immune response when its counterpart becomes infected in some way. This helps to ensure the health of both plants, as severe infections can damage the hybridized exchange tissue in the trunk and inhibit the trade of sugars. There are six major strategies parasites use when exploiting a host. These are as follows. Parasitic castration, directly transmitted parasitism, vector transmitted parasitism, trophically transmitted parasitism, parasitoidism, and micropredation. In this episode, we will be examining the first three of these exploitation strategies, using model organisms to illustrate each, and cover the final three in a part two. This is the Isla Project. The first strategy we will discuss is parasitic castration, where the parasite blocks the host's ability to reproduce for its own benefit. In some cases, it feeds off the host's gonads, a behavior known as direct parasitic castration. In others, the parasite may interfere by secreting hormones that repress reproduction or block the development of the host's genitals. This is known as indirect parasitic castration. While this strategy renders the host infertile or unable to mate, it often affects secondary sexual characteristics as well, such as features that develop with sexual maturity that are involved in mate selection. As a model for parasitic castration, we look to the species Tristophallus typhloba, a cave-dwelling organism belonging to the taxonomic class Dolicopoda. This group describes a wide array of fauna named for their abnormally long legs. Many of Isla's environments select for creatures that are shorter in stature, primarily thanks to the planet's constant winds. When long-legged clades do arise, it's almost always in sheltered environments where wind is not a constant factor. The cave systems inhabited by Tristophallus typhloba are an example of one such environment. From a young age, Tristophallus typhloba are highly independent and abandon the company of their mother mere moments after birth. If they don't, it's not uncommon to see a parent consume their own young. Cannibalism is common among these species, thanks primarily to a lack of nutrients in most regions of the caves. Tristophallus are opportunists and will jump on any opportunity to get a meal, even if it requires them to kill their own kind. In certain situations, however, a lucky individual may find the corpse of another of its species lying within the caves. In instances like this, where the delicopod is heavily exposed, they are particularly vulnerable to small cave-dwelling parasites, such as our example today. Tenax troglavarius is a tiny creature which hides itself in the nooks and crannies of cave systems. Here it lies in wait until it's ready to attack a host. When a wandering delicopod like Tristophallus typhloba passes by, 
Froglavarius mounts it, often by dropping from above, and latches onto it using a number of cupped feet. Slowly, it clambers to the creature's distothoracic end, where it houses its reproductive organs. Here, it inserts its abdomen and mouths into the ovipositor, assuming the host is female, or the seminal chamber if the host is male. Here, it infects the gonads, physically pulling blood and nutrients from the bloodstream which would normally be used in the creation of eggs. It suppresses the usual cycles of ovulation in the host, effectively commandeering the ovipositor. With its reproductive cycles indefinitely halted, infected females often become subject to gigantism, and grow substantially larger thanks to excess energy which would have otherwise been allocated towards reproduction or the making of eggs. This can turn out to be extremely detrimental, as the creature's exaggerated stature limits the extent to which Tristophallus can navigate the caves and fit through tight spaces. The relationship between Tenax troglavarius and Tristophallus typhloba illustrates how the targeting of energetically costly areas of an animal's body, such as the reproductive organs, can be both beneficial for a parasite and costly for the host. Such examples are rarer on Isla, and it's far more common to see examples of directly transmitted parasitism in the classical sense. This is defined as an instance where a parasite is transmitted through physical contact between the host and itself, or the host and a secondary host. Parasites such as this often latch onto the outside of their victims. From here, they either stay and leach the host of nutrients from the outside, or they work their way into the organism. Angustodolamphus acutus is a small, toothpick-sized parasite which is found hiding in permeable soil in almost any suitable environment. Acutus is an invertebrate worm-like organism, however, in its reproductively mature stage, it has a hardened shell which is critical to its strategy for exploiting a host. Adults of this species bury themselves in soil, submerging most of their body with only the pointed tip of their mouth protruding from the ground. It is here that they lie in wait, housed within a small cavity, and using specialized gut bacteria gathered in earlier stages of life, they inflate a special organ in their body known as the gas bladder. The gas which fills this is a byproduct of their digestion, and as pressure builds within the organ, it begins to balloon and expands into the cavity the creature occupies. This seals the area below and creates an air pocket underneath Angustodolamphus acutus. From here, the creature sits in wait for megafauna to walk over it. Clusters of photosensitive cells at its tip are acutely sensitive to changes in light, and it determines the presence of animals based on the shadow they cast on it. When a host inevitably makes the mistake of passing over the tiny parasite's burrow, the change in light initiates a cascading chain of reactions in acutus. In less than half a second, a number of valves in the gas bladder open up and the organ forcefully contracts, expelling all of the gas inside into the cavity below. This creates a rapid change of pressure underneath acutus, which expels it from the ground and launches it into the belly of the creature above. The force generated by this rapid expulsion of gas is enough to bury the front half of the parasite in the flesh of its host. Interestingly, the jettisoning of the parasite from its position in the ground is a behavior known as a fixed action pattern. This is defined as a predictable series of actions that an animal performs in response to a cue. This response is involuntary and it will run to completion even if the key stimulus is false or is removed from the animal's environment. In the case of Angustodolamphus acutus, a certain degree of darkness will trigger the release of gas and the subsequent ejection of the organism. This will occur whenever the light levels reach a certain threshold, regardless of whether there is an animal above casting the shadow. Thus, it is possible to see a confused individual expel itself from the ground even though there is no host above. Once Acutus has embedded itself in the belly of its host, it unwinds a long intestinal tract, once coiled up in the parasite's gut, and proceeds to digest lines of tissue. The energy harvested from the host is almost completely allocated towards the production of eggs, which grow from the protruding abdomen and once reaching maturity, fall to the ground. These eggs are highly resilient, and since they were dropped from a moving host, they are automatically transported to new locations in which they can hatch. This dispersal strategy has resulted in Angustodolamphus acutus ranging all across the planet, often following the migrational paths of the fauna on which they prey. Vector-transmitted parasites rely on an intermediate host in order to be transmitted to its target organism. This intermediate host is generally a hemophagic species which siphons the blood of other animals and in doing so, transmits the microscopic parasite. 
on Earth. Mosquitoes are one of the best known parasitic vectors, and they often carry a plethora of microbial organisms which affect wildlife and humans alike. In the case of female mosquitoes from the genus Anopheles, microparasites such as the eukaryotic plasmodium depend on them to be transmitted to a vertebrate host where they can damage cells in the blood, an affliction we know as malaria. On Isla, Vector-transmitted parasites are also prevalent, and can be transmitted through species such as our previous example. Commonly carried within the gut of Angustodelanthus acutus is a tiny eukaryotic worm known as Clegoia fimbrianus. This organism is transferred into its final host when acutus impales itself into its underbelly and moves between organisms during the digestion of the host tissue. Fimbriatus makes its way into the host's bloodstream, and from here, it migrates to a region of the nervous system known as the chemioptic nucleus. This organ is associated with thermoregulation in most diundecapods, particularly in migrational species. Most diundecapods can be categorized as either exothermic or mesothermic, which means that, to some extent, they require energy from Isla's star to maintain their body temperatures and metabolism. The way that species do this is by expanding or contracting chromatophores in their skin to either absorb or reflect directional light. Chromatophores are tiny sacs of pigment that can change shape when stimulated. In diundecapods, there are two prevalent types of chromatophores, leucophores, which lighten the skin, and melanophores, which darken it. If an animal requires heat, it can darken the coloration of cells on its northern facing side, resulting in a higher rate of energy absorption. If it needs to cool down, it can lighten this region of its body in order to reflect more of the light energy. Clegoia fimbriatus takes advantage of this system of thermoregulation. In order to reproduce, it requires conditions warmer than the resting body temperature of the standard diundecapod, so it manipulates the chemioptic nucleus in order to achieve this. It releases excess melatonin, which acts as a physiological signal for the chemioptic nucleus, and alters the resting function, causing it to falter in its regulation of temperature. With Fimbriatus controlling the creature's means of thermoregulation, it can no longer lighten the pigmentation of its skin, ultimately raising its body temperature and inducing fever-like conditions. In this state, the parasite can spawn, which it does in tissues outside of the gut and at alarming rates. The effects of Clegoia fimbriatus infection are rarely lethal for the host, and oftentimes the feverish symptoms dissipate within a few Earth days of the initial infection. For the parasite, however, this time frame is enough for the creation of millions of young, which will later be excreted in the host's feces. Parasitism is an extremely prevalent part of biological interaction, both on Isla and on Earth. Cases from both are easy to compare. However, I encourage you to contemplate how characteristics of our model planet might change or challenge the parasitic conventions of which we are familiar. There are still three more strategies for parasitic exploitation left to cover, and these will be presented in the next episode, so stay tuned. Before the video ends, however, I'd like to give a quick shout out to a frequent collaborator of mine, Christian Klein, who recently released his speculative biology book, The Teeming Universe. It contains over 250 pages of glorious artwork illustrating a number of theoretical planets, including one which is tidally locked, similar to Isla. This book is truly inspirational, and it's exactly what I would have loved to have when I was growing up and learning about science. I can't recommend it enough, so I'll leave a link to Christian's Amazon store in the description below. If speculative biology interests you at all, I'd encourage you to go check it out. That's all for the Isla Project today. Until next time.